So who in here, um, I know we asked this a little bit before, has never heard of OpenStack or doesn't really know what OpenStack is? Okay, a few. How about on the other side of the spectrum, who uh, absolutely knows everything about OpenStack and has been involved pretty much since the beginning? <laughs> okay, good. So a lot of this content that we just talked about with James and uh, Michael, uh, we'll cover, I have got a few slides for. And if you came for a technical talk, this isn't it, but I think it's a great background in terms of what the foundation is, why the foundation of the foundation is critical to the what everything happens in OpenStack, and some of the evolution and some of the actual activity that you saw in the previous session around how the community behaves was demonstrated here. It is very egalitarian, it's very open, it's very honest, everything happens in the open. There's a lot of discussion, a lot of passionate people. Um, very few decisions, if any, get made behind closed doors. Everything's, again, very, very open. A little bit about me, though. I'm not Eileen Evans, as Michael mentioned. Eileen is my boss. She's an attorney and had some other meetings that came up this week. Uh, she was involved in the discussions and actually the negotiations around a variety of players that we'll see in a minute. I was on the periphery, so I know enough to be dangerous. I'm not an attorney, but I play one on TV. Uh, although I do manage the strategic programs and processes group of HP in the open source program office. So I've been involved in open source for about 10 years um, in a variety of different projects from Linux to now Android on that front, uh, OpenStack in the cloud, Apache, and a variety of other projects. Okay. Um, I do have an engineering background, and from the OpenStack perspective, I've been involved in about two years, which in that community is a lot because things happen so quickly, and even in two years, much has, much has changed. I'm currently working with Eileen on the bylaws, uh, potential bylaws changes, and we'll talk a little bit about what this means around defining what core is. And I think in the previous session with James, that actually came up as part of the discussion. And it is a very dynamic community, and things are happening on a variety of fronts, not just in the technical piece, but also in the legal piece, but also as well as in a variety of other folks that's not really technically oriented, but are very important to the, to the behavior in the, the, the community at large. Okay, so what I wanted to cover today is just what is OpenStack Project? So there are hopefully people that have no background in OpenStack understand what it is, how it started, some of the history, why it's evolved, and then we'll get into more of the specifics around the legalese, the moving it to the foundation, and then finally ending up before lunch uh, talking about some of the dynamic discussions that are going on today that actually have reared itself up already this morning, which is good, because I think that's the healthy community where you can actually express your interest and, and get to consensus. So what is the OpenStack project? So basically, this is a slide that says OpenStack started just three and a half years ago. As Michael mentioned, the two companies came together. In one regards, it was NASA who had this compute project called Nova. On the other hand, Rackspace had this um, object storage project called uh, Swift. They merged, thinking there's a lot of synergies here. Both were in Texas and the United States. Uh, both had similar backgrounds. Obviously, the penchant for uh, Mexican food. Um, they really got together and they saw right away that there was some synergy there. And I think that's a, a, a benefit to them of how this started. And even today, as part of the community, you see a lot of strands of how successful they were in getting together and how open they were. And some of the basic principles even carry over from that first Mexican dinner, even to today. Uh, over 13,000 individual contributors, or not individual members of the foundation. Uh, membership is free. Anybody can go sign up. Again, another a tenet of the community is ability to participate. And having been to a variety of uh, communities now and a variety of summits, it's impressive to me how people can show up at one summit and by the next summit they're leading a, one of the key projects. There's not a lot of hoops to jump through. It's really around do you show up to do work, do you do good work, and then do you merit the benefit of, of that work for leadership to other people. Lots of participating organizations and, and companies that we'll see in a little bit is driving a lot, and you'll see an awful lot in the news about how that is playing out. Some people like it, some people feel it's a liability. And again, very dynamic. We'll see it's different than other things. Uh, as was discussed a little bit before, there are summits. So every six months there's a release, so it's time boxed. So typically in October and April, there's, there will be a release. The next one tentatively scheduled, I think, is April 17th. James, is that still? OK. Middle of April. And then the summit is May 12th. 
Um, so the summit basically is where everybody gets together in the community and establishes the roadmap and the priorities for the next release. Again, very, very open. Very different than anything else that you've seen out there today where the community gets together. People, if they're interested, can go to those detailed design sessions. And as long as they don't interrupt, they're very welcome to participate and see exactly the prioritization and the developers getting together and organizing what the next release becomes. At the same time, there's also a user conference and a business conference, all co-located again, very, very open. May 12th. May 12th is the release or the summit? Uh, the, the summit. Yeah. The next one is date to be determined. In, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So the next upcoming summit is in May in Atlanta, and the follow-on is in Paris next November. Okay. So um, is that yeah. the new formula from now on going forward? One summit in the States, one summit out of the States? I, I don't know if that's the formula, but I think that is the intent, to basically have something that's co-located in the States and then somewhere in the world uh, so that we can make sure that we get plenty of uh, things. Ideally, moving around the world. Yeah. And since I don't work for the foundation and James does, we'll refer all foundation questions to him. <laughs> Although, to be fair to James, he's not involved in that team either. Um, as I mentioned, there are a few tenets, few principles that are very important to this community. Uh, one is open source. From the get-go, it was clear to NASA and to Rackspace to make, really make this thing work called the cloud. It needed to be open source. Uh, the open source license then was chosen was Apache, again, very friendly both to developers as well as to corporations. Um, open design, as I mentioned with the open design summits, everything is out in the open. I think that came up before with Michael and James. Open development and open community. Open really is the permeating factor beyond this. And I think for you, those of us that really truly embrace being open and open source, this additional piece around open community and open development is not just something that we like to say, but it is something that's manifested itself in the community. And even as the board was created, everything is happening out in the open. If you go to Etherpad on any particular day, IRC, all of the decisions that ultimately affect the community are being discussed, being hashed out, and worked through. Okay. I mentioned already that from an Apache perspective, in the early days there was a little bit of discussion and HP got involved, so, um, Rackspace and NASA open sourced it in 2010 in July at OzCon. Uh, HP was involved in investigating a cloud solution re really closely thereafter and heard about this. And one of the things that really drew us to it was the licensing model. And so the fact that there's an Apache licensing model, uh, the corporate contributor agreement where your corporation signs and then individuals that can contribute basically uh, sign up on Launchpad, sign the agreement, and then can get engaged. Very low barrier of entry, which I think helps people understand and communicate to their management, communicate to themselves, um, that there's not a lot of, of difficulty in getting engaged in, in this community. Um, and then there is some trademark policies and documents that we'll, we'll talk about here. Okay. As, as was discussed with James, the project governance really is in kind of, this was the original governance where there was a project technical lead, a project policy board, and then Rackspace was the ultimate, ultimate legal entity that held the trademarks. And that's in, important because as we talked about the, as we talk about how that moved from Rackspace being the limited liability corporation managing all of this, ultimately to the OpenStack Foundation, uh, this governance structure has stayed the same in, in several instances, but has also morphed to Michael's point to, to be more efficient and more effective and to optimize it. So in October 2011, Rackspace made the announcement. Uh, these, the other thing that I'll point out here is, in terms of the number of people that are involved, uh, not just contributors, um, there's I think up to 1,000 com contributors in terms of code, uh, multiple hundreds of, of companies. Uh, these were the original ones that um, signed up to be platinum and gold, and I think this was a key piece around the success of the project. Very early on, many people, companies and contributors, um, understood that this was going to be a project that was a little bit different, but had a lot of promise. 
And so they signed up as an agreement to be able to move this to a foundation when Rackspace made the decision to go ahead and, and create the foundation. Uh, so that was uh, in October. By the, the summit in, I think it was Folsom, in April of 2012, there was this commitment. Now, if any of you know when you get a bunch of attorneys in the room, and I think there were 20, 20 plus attorneys that originally got together, how much difficulty that might be to, to really hash through a, an answer. Um, one of the things that ultimately was learned was to, to, to limit that set of attorneys, but even just the sheer volume of those companies, in six months when I saw this, I said there's absolutely no way that this is gonna happen. And to the foundation's credit, um, Rackspace said no, before the following summit in October, we're going to have a foundation and we're going to be able to say the foundation is managing this project. In six months, I thought there's absolutely no way. But as you can see, before the next summit, it actually was 2012, um, the summit um, which was in San Diego, all of this foundation work had, had taken place. So the drafting committee was formed in late April. They had several revisions through May, June. Um, the, got, the docs were finalized roughly in July and August, and the official foundation was launched in September. Now, Eileen was one of the key members that was in that drafting committee, and one of the things that she likes to express to people is after they initially had this meeting and they kind of nor narrowed down the numbers, these other companies didn't feel necessarily out of, there was a lot of communication. Again, going back, and it's a credit to everybody in the community, everything's done in the open. So even among these attorneys who were working on this crafting of the, this agreement, there was a lot of discussion, a lot of activity back and forth, but at the end of the day, it was communicated to everybody, and ultimately everybody worked through it. And by September, everybody had signed. Now again, that list of people were the initial ones. Over the summer, more people joined on, and we'll see in a minute, just the sheer number of, just number of sponsors and gold and platinum members that have since uh, contributed but the Board of Directors has actually been meeting since September of 2012. Okay. I talked a little bit about this. Um, the other thing that was introduced, which I think is also a, a key learning, was not just that the attorneys did a small drafting committee, but there was a business issues forum. Again, who are the key constituents? Let's do it out in the open and let's make sure that we inform them what are the issues as we're drafting this document which ultimately became the bylaws, making sure that the, the, the business leaders had that same information. So in terms of what does the foundation look like today, I know this came up a little bit in terms of the questions. Uh, so on the right or on the left is the prior to the foundation, project technical leads, project policy board, and ultimately the Rackspace OpenStack LLC that managed all of the trademarks. What exists now? is very similar in terms of the projects. We heard about the PTLs, again, elected by their peers, have leadership responsibility within their projects, and the PTLs govern their project, um, and right now there's a variety of them, we'll see a list in a minute. The technical committee, uh, we've talked a little bit about, but that really is the, the board, or the entity that manages the technical direction of the project. So anything to do with the technical development goes through the technical committee. Uh, which is now elected. It used to be automatic seats for some PTLs and not for others, uh, depending on a, a kind of a formula. Now it's everybody's elected, and everybody on the technical committee comes out of the technical uh, community and has contributed actual code in order to vote. And then there's the board of directors for the foundation. And the foundation, I think, as James mentioned, manages the trademarks and other associated legalese. So their job is to make sure that the trademarks are used appropriately. So anytime that you say OpenStack or use the OpenStack logo, there's an agreement in place that allows you to do that. The OpenStack Foundation manages that. Okay. And there's a board of directors that, that's elected. Okay. So I talked about a little bit, but here's a few as we wrap up this section on just moving to a foundation. I'm amazed that in six months, so many attorneys and so many businesses and so many people that were involved uh, got, th got this done. Uh, but it's a tribute to everybody who was involved. Um, open dialogue again. No one, everybody went in with the assumption that it was gonna be open, that there were issues. And as you even see today, 
no one's shy about the issues. They bring them up, they discuss them, and even if people don't always agree completely, there is a consensus that emerges and the community moves forward. Uh, the member companies signed the commitment letters, which indicated that, yes, when this whole thing was done, uh, they were going to be part of this board of directors or part of this foundation, uh, which I think is a key thing. We talked about the business leaders forum where they could hash over some of the issues. Uh, there was a small drafting committee. Um, and then there were some parallel meetings that were, were happening. So as we talk about just how this happens, I think you start to permeate some of these principles that were learned early on in the foundation are examples of meetings and examples of interactions that happen today in the community. And we can go to the community and actually see some of these things play out. Okay. One of the things that's also impressive is that over time is we talked about the, the two projects, Nova and Swift, were the original two projects. Now, this community is about three and a half years old, and this is the list of official projects off of the OpenStack.org website. We talked about Ceph, we talked about other projects not necessarily being official, uh, but this is the list of uh, official. Uh, there is still some discussion in terms of what projects mean versus programs that we'll get to in a minute, but this is the list. Uh, so quickly, right after Nova and Swift came Glance, so from an object store, you also had an image store. Uh, in order to manage all the identity pieces, it's a project called Keystone. After that, there was a need for a UI to manage all of this across the board, and so the, the dashboard project became a part of OpenStack, and that's called Horizon. Uh, networking is a key piece for everything, so Neutron became a project. Lock storage with Cinder, uh, how do you manage or monitor this? Uh, Solometer. Orchestration, Heat, and Database Service Trove, uh, Ironic, Marconi, and you see the, the, the list. So as things evolve and as the project has, has needed a, um, the project isn't static. And so as it has evolved and as there's, it, there is a need for additional functionality, built into the bylaws is a way to expand the, the community itself. Now, with that expansion also has come a little bit of growing pains, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a, in a minute, where what does it really mean to be core? So if you just have Swift, if you just have Nova, is that core? If you just have a few of the components, is that core? So those are some of the discussions that are currently happening right now. Um, in fact, tomorrow morning, there's a meeting on that. Okay. In terms of the board of directors, there's kind of three tiers. The platinum level is for those high-level sponsors that get an automatic board seat, and you can see who those are. There's eight of them. Likewise, there's eight board of directors coming from that middle tier, which is the gold uh, board of directors. That's made up of companies that are also sponsors, uh, but they're not at the highest level, so they don't get an automatic board seat. They elect members from their, um, their own group of gold members. And then there's individual directors, which don't have to have any affiliation. Basically, they're elected at large. And I think, as James mentioned earlier, it's great that there's some technical leadership from the TC, from the project technical leads on this committee. Um, but they're individual elected, and you can see that they're typically one to two year, or actually one year, and they're re-elected every year, and the elections are finishing up in two weeks. The 17th, I believe, is the date. Yep. I'd like to point out, too, that you're seeing things. First of all, the at-large, there are, someone here is an additional person from Rackspace, an additional person from Red Hat, an additional person from Machine. Um, and two of the people, individual directors, are from this side Excellent. Mark is pointing out for the video that, um, that looking at the list, there are a couple people that from this part of the world, um, Lin Cheng, Hui Cheng, and then Tristan Good, who couldn't be here today. Both are, well, Tristan's from Australia and Hui is from China. Um, and it's also good um, that there's other people represented from, one of the, the, one of the key concerns that was brought up earlier as part of the bylaws, and I didn't talk about this earlier, was that there's a limit in terms of the project uh, board of directors, they, you can have one com particular company cannot have more than two representatives. So for instance, if there is an individual who is very merit-based and deserves election on the board, and someone else already is on the board of directors, no more people from that company can participate on the board of directors. They can be involved in a variety of other ways, but it really, there was some concern early on that someone would stack the board and ultimately make all the decisions. And very early on, again, this group of, of decision makers and, and drafters of the bylaws said, well, we don't want that to happen. So no more, if, if someone is merit, merits it, we want them on the board, but we also don't want to have a stacked board. 
I think by and large, uh, there has been some discussion on how do we change the, the, the election process to, to be more, even more egalitarian. But by and large, I think everyone would agree that the people on the board are very, very worthy of being on the board. Yeah. Uh, in terms of the project technical leads, this is just the current uh, state. Uh, the interesting thing about the PTL is they're elected from release to release. So at the last summit in Hong Kong in November, this group of people were elected by their peers to represent these projects and to lead these projects. And they'll be the PTL either until they step down uh, before the next release, which has, has happened when people get so busy, or at the next summit there will be a, a follow-on election to see if these individuals continue or as often happens someone else steps up as, and kind of rotates. Okay. Technical committee, very similar election happen, you can see the representation across the board. Um, again, one of the things I really appreciate about the origination of this project is that even though it started with two companies, you still see a lot of leadership from, from those two companies, or at least the people that were involved. Um, but by and large, you see a, a, a breadth of contributions from a variety of other companies, GOs, uh, and again, that very open and perspective of con contributing. Okay, so what are some of the, the key challenges to the community at large? All right, everything's not rosy within the OpenStack community. Uh, by and large, there's a lot of positive things that have happened over the last three years, three and a half years. Um, there's just a few sampling uh, piece. I didn't include the one uh, that was brought up earlier around, some people think it's a good thing to have so many companies involved, some people think it's a bad thing. There's been a lot of blogs on both sides, lots of discussion. I think the key thing for me is the technology ultimately in the community will win where the technology is good and meets the customer need. And so in as much as the OpenStack community can stay focused on the needs of the customers and the needs of the people that are actually using the software, uh, both developers and users, uh, I think the technology will continue to be good and the momentum will continue in the community. But I don't know of any other community in three and a half years to have such an upswell as, as the OpenStack community. And so I think that's the positive thing and I think it ultimately boils down to the openness and honesty that, that as these questions play out. The previous questions, as I mentioned before, around foundation, that was a huge, huge uh, move to move the governance structure from a corporation to a foundation for the longevity of the project. And it, it was done looking back over the course of just six months, which seemed seamlessly, and I know for everyone who was involved, it wasn't necessarily that seamless, but still in six months to get that done. Likewise, there's some, a few, few uh, community questions that are, are happening out right now. One is this definition of what is core. So as OpenStack grows, it's almost a victim of its own success. More people want to participate, more people have a, an itch that they want to scratch. There is more need to integrate. Customers want, to, want that seamless to happen. So there is this discussion of what is core. In order to use the trademark then, there's a, a set of criteria by which if you use the OpenStack trademark, you must meet this definition. And early on, there was a, a discussion around needing to have that core definition defined. And that's the conversation that's happening right now. So as I mentioned, tomorrow there's another meeting. Um, Rob Hirschfeld from Dell is leading this discussion uh, within the community. A variety of folks are involved. Uh, Eileen's involved in terms of the trademark piece. Um, but again, what is core is really essential to everything. I think it came up in Bru Bruno's question before. And again, it's not a question that has an answer yet. It's a question that is currently being uh, discussed, debated, and the merits on, both, on all sides are, are coming out. But what does it mean to be a core? Is it an API? Is it an implementation? Is it one? Is it the other? Is there certain criteria? Is it tests that have to pass? Um, and all of that is, is currently being discussed right now. Yeah? So the question is, is that really a board thing or a TC thing? So the, where, where it's handled is the board had the original discussion because it's in the bylaws that the trademark can only be used if, it, if the core definition is followed. The core definition had really never been flushed out enough. So when the board met, I think at the last summit, they ultimately decided, yes, we gotta go figure this out. And they kicked off a subcommittee uh, led by uh, members of the, of the, it's not really a TC thing, it's, it's really more of a members of the community at large. So right now, it, there's members of, it's not really managed by the board at all. They basically said, here, gave it to Rob. He's off uh, leading this subcommittee, which now has subcommittees of its own, uh, to handle this question, and we'll report back. 
ultimately, I think there's a couple pieces here that both pertain to the TC and the board because there's this definition of what is a project. We talked about projects versus programs. Um, that's another question that is the, the community at large is dealing with too, that there isn't consensus in terms of what does that mean. So as new projects come on, are they projects, are they programs? There's a lot of discussion, confusion around that. So there's trying to get some clarity at the same time around that. That's really a bylaws piece that will have to go in the bylaws because in the bylaws right now, there's a definition of projects being core. So that's a board of directors thing. At the lower level, then there's a the question of what does that really mean? And long term for the project, let's get it out of the bylaws. Um, and again, I'm sharing some of the current thoughts. So let's, let's not codify it in the bylaws so that the next time some projects come up, let's give enough uh, guidance in the bylaws to such, here's what a project is, here's what core means, but leave it at that and then defer all the other discussions to the technical committee. So right, right now what Rob is doing is leading all of these community members, um, variety of folks on the TC and, t and the community at large to figure out what does that criteria look like. And then Eileen is leading the piece around, okay, if there is a change, what does that change look like? And then what do the bylaws need to be amended so that we can not have, to have this discussion in six months or a year that for long term, let's optimize it and move on. Is that a, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, great question. Um, and the other piece, that was, so API is also a key question uh, in the community. Uh, this one's died down a little bit in the, in the last little bit, but what does it mean to be, a, do we want compatibility with, say, other projects uh, like Amazon, um, with Cloud Stack, with other cloud providers, uh, or do we just have basically an open stack API and that becomes the de facto standard? Um, so that's a discussion that's happening, not as intense as it was before. And then this whole thing around training. Um, so we're among developers. Developers are, will d download things and, and use it, but users themselves uh, want to have the ability to install it, um, use it seamlessly. And the more people that understand OpenStack and can download and install it easily, the more uptake it will have in terms of the deployments. So it's a virtuous cycle there. And so there's a lot of questions around how do we scale training and how do we get it out there. Uh, there's a few people that are, or a few companies that are doing a lot of training. Uh, the foundation itself has initiated a uh, training program to help in the very similar way that we, get, we do code. Uh, there are actually a lot of people that aren't developers that want to participate in OpenStack and they're developing training modules in the very similar way. There's a Git repository, there's a foundation, they come to the, they come to the foundation and, and work together in a community to develop the training. Likewise, if you are already a vendor and have provide, or provide training, there's a training marketplace from the foundation that you can participate in, okay? And so scaling it. Um, I talked a little bit about this, but since this is such a hot topic and it's so uh, happening right now, I thought I'd throw in a few slides on this. Um, so go, going back to the previous question around, it was, this committee was formed during the last summit. That mission is to define OpenStack core, and there is a current focus on defining what projects versus programs is. And again, the URLs are there. Everything's out in the open, so everything is on Etherpad, all of the minutes from the previous meetings. The meeting tomorrow, the invite is on Etherpad. So if you're interested about getting up, um, I think it's 3 or 4 a.m. Uh, <laughs> Perth time, to participate in that meeting, you're, you're welcome to. But again, everything is, is very open, very transparent. Things are happening quickly, but to everyone's credit, they're out in the open. So there's nothing that's hidden. There's no hidden agendas that aren't being documented and a variety of folks are, are working on it. Likewise, there's two subcommittees to this committee. Uh, there's the one that Eileen is leading in the terms of the bylaws and the trademark licensing. And there's a criteria and subcommittee uh, which has been formed out of the technical body to understand if you do define core, what does that mean technically and what's the criteria? And currently, as it stands, there's 14 um, items of what, or 11 items of what that really looks like in terms of core. So here's the criteria. Um, I'll just leave that up there. I know you guys can read it. Um, but this is the current thinking, again, of that body as of last week. The URL has all the, the nitty gritty details, but. Uh, again, the criteria by which will be core is, is a key thing around what is tested, testable, how long should it be tested. If it remains core, 
we don't want things to come into core and out of core. Um, so there's a lot of thought being discussed around what is the criteria by which uh, all of this takes place. Okay. And again, if you want to participate um, and have any sort of um, sense of where this should go, uh, pr jump in, uh, participate in the conversation. It is a very open community. Um, although, like most communities, make sure that you know what you're talking about before you jump in. While everyone else is reading that, are there any questions? Yeah. So that's a great question. So the question is, with all these companies involved, how do you differentiate if ultimately the community brings in everybody? Do you hold some of the software back? Um, and I think that's one of the big questions around the community, which is so exciting why so many people are coming in, is there are a lot of opportunities on a variety of, of pieces. We already talked about Swift being there from the beginning, but Ceph is now stepping in. Uh, there's the distribution piece of things. There's the services piece of things. There's the training piece of things. So there's a variety of different aspects of what this community can provide that enables companies to make money. A lot is still yet to be determined. It's still a nascent emerging market. Um, from a customer perspective, I think one of the key things, though, is that there's got to be some portability. So if a customer engages OpenStack now, in a few years, are they still OpenStack? And I think what we don't want to have happen is what happened to the Unixes of 30 years ago, which I think is why Linux has, has been so successful. Everyone's standardizing on a Linux. Sure, there's a few distributions and there's a few ways that people can differentiate along the Linux distributions, but by and large, a Linux distribution is a Linux distribution. And if they wanted to, people could go to kernel.org and download it themselves. There's nothing inherently wrong or bad about doing it yourself. It's just a matter of what, what type of flavor do you want? And I think so that at the core, that's exactly what we're doing here. Mark and then Bruno. Thank you. 
source working implementation all the software. And in companies that have a hardware or proprietary plugin solution, there is a um, <laughs> So Mark added some additional pieces around data sovereignty as a way to differentiate, also ways around uh, different um, deployment models, uh, different workloads. Uh, all of those are still a work in progress. Uh, some of the modules now are being deployed uh, with the continuous integration. Uh, some things, some companies are going away as they realize that this is getting rolled into the OpenStack as a whole, that everybody benefits. And I think you'll see some fracturing of this is a great business model for four or six months and then it gets rolled in. And I think the exciting thing for me is even in the last two years, in three years since it started, so much has happened and no one can really predict where it's going. And it's, it's, I think it also attributes to Linux, which came before, uh, where people now recognize the power of open source and now they really try to figure out what the right balance is. And even within OpenStack themselves, there's, open, there's a project mantra around how do we build Nova so that you can participate in these other virtual machines? How do we build Neutron so that other people can participate? And so there's that concept of we don't want to not be, we do not want to get, the customer ultimately has a choice and if they want a third party tool in there, let's facilitate them using that within the cloud environment so that what we capture is the customer and they can use OpenStack and OpenStack serves their needs. And then whatever solutions that vendors provide over time, it will evolve. And I think that's still the, the big question is what types of, of services will be provided. Yeah, Bruno. Um, so just on my own correction, when Mark raised the question, he was saying that uh, there's this question of service on the world model. And I don't think this is really the question. I think the question is, if let's say HP was driving the scene, then everyone would be pissed off if we had to use Freebot as our storage solution. Mm -hmm. so Well, I th and again, uh, th this is a very heated topic, so for the video, the question is around, I mischaracterized it or maybe undercharacterized the question before around Ceph not being part of the, the core. The question really is around what does it mean to be core, and in the case of Swift, um, with it not being, with, with its being a complete vertical solution, is that part of core or not when you can't swap anything out before, just like a KVM or a, a virtual machine in another, from another flavor. Um, and I think that's exactly the, the, why the community at large is struggling with it. I think Michael captured it pretty well earlier. This is a heated discussion which has taken multiple, multiple weeks. So and, I think there's yeah. a disconnect here I want to highlight, which is that there's no restriction that stops anyone using Ceph. The, this stuff is all talking about the trademarks. So it's specifically saying if you're a vendor and you're, for example, you're a vendor that sells service, installation services, I'll install OpenStack for you. You can't install and say, I'm installing the OpenStack cloud unless you meet all of this criteria up on the board. Yeah. So yeah. as a user, you regardless of this discussion, as a user, you have complete option of using CF or not using CF, and you always will. Well, you can, but then, well, how would you feel if uh, someone would tell you you cannot call your cloud OpenStack implementation because it isn't HTTP 5 or let's say? So, so
so I think there's a couple of things happening here. I feel like we're off on a tangent, but um, the fundamental problem you have is the Swift team does not agree with you that a plugin layer is a good idea. You need to convince them, not any of us. Right? Um, and that is a, a that, that should be a discussion based on the technical merits and a consensus kind of something, something right? And the fundamental problem is that the Swift team does not think that a plugin layer makes sense for technical reasons. So they need to be convinced by those technical reasons aren't valid or whatever, right? Um, fundamentally, what Core is saying is OpenStack is something special. It's a community that does things in a certain way and works together. And where, where we're kind of where we're coming from is we don't want you replacing Noble with this random thing you wrote in JavaScript and thought it was funny. Because we have spent years of our lives building this very special community. And OpenStack is a community. You can build whatever cloud you want, but you can only call it OpenStack if it complies with the Watson Core criteria. Yeah. Because that's the special bit. That's what we're trying to change. And it's not to find Watson Core yet, right? It may, Nova may not be in the list of things we require. Like lots of people deploy just Swift, right? Swift may not be in Core because we know there isn't a consensus yet. Um, but so, the, the interesting bit here is this committee isn't trying to define what pieces of software are in core, they're trying to define the process for defining of what pieces of software are in core. And I think that's the key distinction right around this committee is that ultimately the decision going back to the previous one is we want to make sure that the bylaws from a foundational perspective will facilitate having this discussion because this won't be the last discussion. As things come on, what are the criteria by which we evaluate? And then ultimately turning it over to the technical merits of whatever decision is, is made. Now again, I think that's one of the other things around the community where sometimes in the press you'll get the negative around there's not really a benevolent dictator to make a decision and let's move on. You could understand that argument. By and large though, I think we've seen in the technical community that there's a lot of good arguments on both sides and we'll see how this one plays out. Um, but I think it, for me it's a tribute to the community that you can have such depth of conversation like this and ultimately move on uh, with a, a consensus. Now in this regard, I don't know what the consensus will be because it's still an emerging thing, but I wanted to include it because it is an ex for me it's a highlight of an example of the dynamicism of the community and the depth of discussions on both sides uh, of what we, what we see currently. And again, if you want to participate, it's all out in the open. Okay. Other comments, questions? Yeah. So the question is, is that the board of directors get selected and voted upon by the uh, membership at large? Who selects the chairman and the vice chairman? And I believe that's also by voting. And so in their very first board meeting, they basically selected from among themselves who would be the, the chairman. And I, I don't have the slide up here, but uh, Alan Clark from um, SUSE is the chairman, and the vice chairman is Lou Tucker from Cisco. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so when is voting taking place? Very, uh, today. Uh, 17th is, I think, when the voting closes. So the 17th of January. Or 17th is when it opens. I have received my ballot that he's running the election. Is it open on the 14th? Uh, I think it's open on the 14th. Okay. Yeah. Is it open on the 14th? Yeah. So we'll defer all questions to the foundation and he'll have an answer. Uh, uh, January 13th through January 17th. Okay. So it opens on the 13th, closes on the 17th. Small window. Make sure you vote. Uh, the open, the, 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 I don't know who's actually running it, but I know that the call for people who were yeah. wanting to run has been open for a yeah, month or two. Yeah, so open on the 13th, closing on the 17th. So please vote if you're a member. If you're not a member, you can easily become a member. You won't be able to vote this time. Uh, but again, the OpenStack community wants every participant that will get engaged and, and make a contribution. I also yeah. just wanted to make a clarification. Um, when you were talking about uh, the technical committee, um, uh, I just want to clarify that uh, criteria for standing for election for the technical committee does not require uh, that one be uh, a, a tech, have a technical background. It, you just have to be able to have enough people to vote for you that you have demonstrated uh, competence in being able to make technical decisions.
Okay, good, good clarification that the TC doesn't require you to have a technical background. You just need to be competent enough to make technical decisions and have enough people uh, that trust you to vote for you, enable that. Yeah, and you actually have, you have to be a, a contributor. And in this case, one of the big contributors on the TC is the documentation lead um, who knows as much about OpenStack as anybody else um, or highly very much and makes a huge contribution even though she doesn't write code. Yeah, Jonathan. Uh, based on some of the things that you said, I would obviously like to say, I'm, my name's John, I'm the ETL expert. If you have questions about things related to that, I'd be happy to talk. Great. Well, thanks, Jonathan. I wasn't going to point you out, uh, but there he, open invitation, <laughs> which I think is a great thing because he's not shying away from the discussion. Again, open and honest. So hopefully this clarified a little bit about what OpenStack is, what the foundation is, how we got to where we are. There's still a lot of room for contributions. Uh, by and large, there's still a plenty of green field to go uh, plant and harvest and do a lot of things with, a variety of different projects to get involved with. So whatever you like, uh, please get engaged. Uh, please uh, participate and make the community better. So with that, uh, thank you.